Greetings to all of you from around the world. I'm very honored to be a part of the Achieve Project, which is organized by Sergio Giacini to bring all of us together from around the world to discuss important problems regarding thrombosis. Today, I would, pre I would like to present a short video just highlighting some things, uh, including uh, not one size fits all for as far as thrombosis is concerned. And this is particularly important with the COVID patients. And one must use a risk assessment score uh, to, to evaluate patients today. We know that all patients are not the same. Uh, you can use a variety of scores. We prefer the Caprini score because it's 40 elements, but there's lots of good scores out there and you really need to be using a score. The importance of doing that is to provide appropriate prophylaxis according to the level of risk. If people have a lot of additional risk factors, then you have to apply uh, in, in increased prophylaxis. One of the things that really bothers me is people say, well, as long as you, uh, 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 if you're not ambulatory, you're at risk, but once, once you become ambulatory, your risk of thrombosis goes down. Well, that's, that's not necessarily true. Ambulation only reduces the risk of, of bed rest. If you have cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, past history of thrombosis, you can walk all you want. Those risk factors are not going to go away. You have to also understand that COVID-19 is associated with an increased level of risk. And this is a very important feature of the disease and it's littered with thrombosis. And for that reason, we have to be using anticoagulation in all of these patients. It's a question of a matter of degree. And remember that anticoagulation alone is not the total answer. We also have to be updating our risk score as we go through hospitalization, but then particularly at discharge, we have to apply prophylaxis to those people that have increased risk, not give everybody prophylaxis when they go home, even if they have COVID-19. We know that doesn't work, but we know from the Riete registry that most people get their clots when they go home. So picking out those people with the most baggage, those people that have high risk scores, have COPD, have diabetes requiring insulin, BMI of over 35 or 40, past history of thrombosis. Those are the people that need ongoing prophylaxis. And in those patient groups, it's been shown in many studies that 30 days of prophylaxis is better than seven days of prophylaxis. So I would like to ask all of you to enjoy this presentation. I ask many questions, there's some provocative statements and I look to all of you to help me prove or disprove some of these opinions and postulates going forward. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the uh, presentation. Hello, everyone. It is a great pleasure to present this talk regarding thrombosis risk assessment during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a part of the Advances in Comprehensive Venus Education, the ACHIEVE program, through the leadership of Sergio Giacini. These are my disclosures. We have chosen the Caprini score for this exercise because it is the most comprehensive history and physical that has been validated worldwide in over 5 million patients in approximately 200 studies. We know from the, the past that as the number of risk factors goes up, the incidence of venous thrombosis goes up. We also know that each risk factor has a different power some are very low power like bed rest and some are very high power like cancer of the pancreas. So taking the powers and combining them with a number of risk factors and putting that together to give a simple score and that score goes up in a non-algorithmic fashion as the incidence of venous thrombosis rises. So as the number goes up, the incidence of clots goes up. And here you see this in general surgery, and these are real clinically relevant events. Now, capturing all 40 elements in the score is a time-consuming process, and we understand that at the time of an emergency uh, or a uh, accident or stroke, that uh, going through all of these is a very difficult thing to do. So we believe that the collection should be facilitated by the patient completing a preliminary patient-friendly form in advance of any problems or elective surgery, ideally with the help of family members. These family members can assist in completing the form also at the type of time of hospitalization if necessary. Then the physician or other health care provider responsible for the admitting history and physical can review the form and create an initial document. 
This document's in a variety of languages. It's in patient-friendly lingo, but I want to point out two very special things about this risk scoring system. It tracks the uh, obstetrical uh, complications, which may hide the thrombophilic factor of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And this syndrome is a very powerful one, and if it can be persist through life long after the obstetrical incidents are gone and represents a significant risk factor for thrombosis. Similarly, another frequently missed risk factor is family history of thrombosis. It's very important to capture this uh, family history because it often will change what you do with the patient in terms of their risk scoring. The score is a dynamic instrument and needs to be revised during hospital stay, reflecting things such as reoperation, infection, central lines, a cancer that was diagnosed, and the updated score in many cases will result in a change in thrombosis prophylaxis, including post-discharge anticoagulant prophylaxis. It is to be remembered that this is a dynamic instrument. You can't do an admission risk score and forget about it. You have to do it all the way up to discharge. That's an extremely important consideration. We have come up with a series of recommendations for the coronavirus patients, which are not evidence-based, but they're based on past experience and also the fact that these patients are at increased risk compared to the general population with the same risk factors. We add a score of two for patients diagnosed that are asymptomatic. If they have symptoms, we increase it to three, and if the D-dimer is positive, five. This is in addition to all of the other scoring points the patient may accumulate as a result of their risk factors. So what do we know about the coronavirus so far? We will know that this is a virus-induced inflammation that triggers a cytokine storm causing tissue factor release, thrombin generation, fibrin formation to coat the virus and prevent the spread. That's a very nice mechanism. The unfortunate side effect of all this coating with thrombin is thrombosis. And not only that, but the activation of these systems causes hypercoagulability with DVT, pulmonary emboli, pulmonary uh, uh, thrombosis, stroke, arterial thrombosis in, in as well. Microthrombosis may occur in the lungs, liver, kidney, or brain, and fibrinolysis may occur to dissolve the thrombin. A DIC-like picture can result in thrombosis or bleeding, depending on the consumption of clotting factors and platelets. These systems are not new and have been described for many years, and through the activation of Hageman factor, platelets, coagulation, fibrinolysis, inflammatory systems, and kinin systems can be all triggered through the contact activation pathway of factor 12. As you can see, a number of effects in the body occur, most notably vasodilatation, increased vascular permeability, phagocytosis, binding pathogens, and cell me membrane damage due to the virus. Now, COVID-19 is the tangled hemostatic web on steroids. It's an incredibly powerful virus, There's, and you may think of it as spikes, and these spikes pierce the endothelial cells throughout the body, and, in, in, and this is facilitated by angioreceptor 2, angiotensin receptor 2, and as a result of that, you can have widespread thrombosis due to the vascular damage. Remember, anticoagulation alone is not the answer to reverse all of these multiple systems. We will need more and more research to attack this virus from all sides. The virus has a, has a predilection for the very, very delicate alveolar endothelial interface in the lungs. And as a result of that, and as I said before, the ACE2 facilitates piercing the endothelium, and gas exchange is uh, inhibited, and as a result of that, you get these ground glass appearances on chest X-ray, and that's responsible uh, for a lot of the respiratory symptoms. Remember also, unique to this particular problem, pulmonary thrombosis occurs, as well as pulmonary hemorrhages. Now, there is no one risk assessment guideline 
that everybody agrees upon. The Chats Consensus Group and ASH only recommend prophylactic anticoagulation. Uh, ISTH uh, is more of in favor of escalating the prophylaxis depending on the degree of risk. And we at the American Venus Forum have come up with our own schema, which uh, calls for a risk assessment necessary on admission, and the, the Caprini score will quickly identify and quantify the comorbidities. And patients that have a score of over eight, which usually reflects the combination of age, multiple risk factors, ambulatory status, elevated BMI, respiratory insufficiency, heart problems, and the like, these scores of over eight, we double the prophylaxis because we feel these patients are at very high risk and experience has taught us that in individuals with these risk factors in the normal population before COVID, breakthrough thrombosis often occurred on the standard prophylactic regimen. We must make sure that these patients get scored during the hospitalization and at discharge. And again, if the score is over eight at discharge, we recommend continuing the prophylaxis for at least 35 days. Now we've known for many, many years that most of the patients get their clots when they go home from the hospital and also half of them after anticoagulation is discontinued. These data have now been reaffirmed in, in more modern studies. But remember, COVID-19 introduces a whole new level of increased complexity to these patients. As a result of that, we feel that post-discharge prophylaxis should be used, and there, is data, there are data available that indicate this use. We know that more than 25% of medically ill patients will fit this category. 60% of VTEs in another study occur after discharge. Symptomatic uh, pulmonary emboli are often seen, and 80% uh, of these <clears throat> events occur within six weeks. Despite these data, less than 4% of patients are sent home on prophylaxis. We have abundant data from multiple trials, especially with the new drugs, that they do work. And if you're using another risk score, that's fine. But f it's very, very important that you provide prophylaxis ongoing after discharge in these patients. So finally, in conclusion, <laughs> perform risk assessment using your favorite tool. Understand the widespread involvement of the vasculature in this disease. Pulmonary thrombosis and alveolar endothelial damage are prominent features of this disease. Arterial or venous thrombosis can occur anywhere in the body and also include organ insufficiency. Tailoring the intensity of anticoagulation is the key to success and performing ultrasound scanning for specific indications only. Post-discharge prophylaxis is required for most patients. Thank you very much for your attention during this lecture, and we'll look forward to a lively discussion session.